Hello again, everybody. We'll talk here about the pancreatic pseudocyst. And, uh, just looking at our anatomy of the pancreas, uh, we have our head here, uh, which is uh, medial, uh, and then going laterally, we have the neck and the body and the tail, which is going to be on the left side in pretty much everybody. So uh, where the pancreas sits, uh, it's posterior to the stomach uh, and the duodenum. Uh, but it's anterior to the uh, great vessels of the uh, abdomen. And so that would be your aorta, your abdominal aorta, and your inferior vena cava. It also sits posterior to the transverse colon, comes into contact with that a little bit. Uh, the duct of the pancreas runs from the tail to the head and uh, exits the pancreas and joins up with the common biliary duct at which point then it will become the ampulla of water and enter into the duodenum. Now when we're thinking about uh, pancreatic pseudocysts, it's uh, going to be important to think about uh, the, the duct of the pancreas because this is what actually is uh, injured and ultimately uh, leads to the formation of the pseudocyst. All right, so let's talk about a patient here. A 42-year-old man presents to your clinic complaining of progressive discomfort in his abdomen over the past two weeks. He describes the discomfort as a dull ache and a sensation of fullness. His wife adds that lately he doesn't seem to be eating as much uh, dinner as he usually does. He denies changes in bowel habits or stool color. He hasn't vomited and he's not nauseous. His medical history is significant for a recent episode of acute biliary pancreatitis, during which he spent six days hospitalized, including a laparoscopic cholecystectomy with an uncomplicated postoperative course. He is otherwise healthy, has a normal BMI, and does not smoke or drink alcohol. He has no other surgical history. On physical exam, you note moderate epigastric and left upper quadrant tenderness. The abdomen is not distended, and there is no palpable masses. Bowel sounds are normal, and the rectal exam is negative for masses, uh, and he's also GOYAC negative. Vitals are within normal limits. So what are we going to order? A typical order for abdominal pain. Uh, you definitely want to get an amylase in addition to your, uh, in addition to your routine labs. Uh, remember, your CMP, your complete metabolic panel, is just your basic metabolic panel plus the liver function test. We want to have liver function tests because, one, this is a patient who has a history of stones. He's got a history of uh, biliary pancreatitis. And we want to have the amylase and lipase uh, because he has a history of pancreatitis, so we want to see where that's at. Uh, the abdominal x-ray is good anytime you have uh, abdominal pain. We want to rule out obstruction. Even though he uh, doesn't report any, uh, any problems with bowel movements, abdominal x-ray is uh, something that's good to get on your initial workup. So his labs, uh, CBC comes back normal. Just your white count. His white count is a little bit uh, on the high end of normal. CMP is unremarkable. His amylase and lipase are both elevated, uh, but they're not elevated to the degree that they would be with acute pancreatitis. So uh, with remember with acute pancreatitis, which I guess could be on your differential diagnosis here, even though acute pancreatitis tends to be much more significant abdominal pain, not the pain that you wait two weeks on to come in uh, to the clinic. You probably come into the ER four hours after it comes on. Uh, we still want to order amylase and lipase because he has a history of pancreatitis and because if you've had acute pancreatitis recently, you are at a risk to get it again. And so we do still want to order the amylase and lipase. Interestingly, the amylase and lipase are elevated, but they're not what we would expect it for acute pancreatitis. What do we expect with acute pancreatitis for amylase and lipase? And you should know this, even though you're given the uh, even though you're given the uh, the uh, normal values on USMLE, you should know that for acute pancreatitis, the values should be three times or greater than the upper limit of normal. So here we have an amylase that's only 205, still elevated, but not three times the upper limit of normal. So there's something pancreatic going on here, but it's not acute pancreatitis. 
it's not chronic pancreatitis either because he's only had one episode of pancreatitis and he's not a drinker, he doesn't smoke, he's relatively healthy. So what's going on with the pancreas that's not pancreatitis? Well, you probably know because it's the subject of this lecture, but just humor me here. What's the next best step? You've got this patient, amylase and lipase are elevated, he's got this fullness, abdominal pain, chronic abdominal pain, it's dull, not sharp abdominal pain, uh, not the severe ripping abdominal pain that radiates to the back that you would have with acute pancreatitis. What are we going to do here? Anytime you have a patient who is uh, having a sensation of fullness in their abdomen, we want to look into their abdomen. And even though the abdominal x-ray came back normal, the abdominal x-ray can't see everything. And what we want to get is an abdominal ultrasound. The abdominal ultrasound is going to help us see any uh, masses that we might not be able to palpate. Even though on physical exam we couldn't palpate any masses, you can't always palpate masses. So uh, the abdominal ultrasound comes back with no gallstones, no abnormality of the pancreatic parenchyma, and a well-defined 4 centimeter non-echoic mass in the area of the pancreas. So what is this? Uh, well, here's our non-echoic mass. Here's our pancreas right here. Remember the pancreas has about the same echogenicity of the liver. I believe this would be your portal vein coming up here. I'm not sure I didn't do this ultrasound. All right. Uh, so this is a, pa a patient with pancreatic pseudocyst. Uh, and the best next diagnostic step after we get an abdominal ultrasound that is suspicious for a pancreatic pseudocyst, or really any mass in the pancreas, next best step is going to be an abdominal CT. So a pancreatic pseudocyst is one of the most common complications of acute and chronic pancreatitis. If it comes on with acute pancreatitis, it usually presents around four to six week period after the acute pancreatitis started. So uh, this patient may be five, six weeks out after his pancreatitis that he had, and now he's coming in with this fullness in his abdomen and this mild pain. With chronic pancreatitis, though, it can happen at any time. It can also happen after trauma to the uh, abdomen. So let's say you got kicked in the gut and you got in a bar fight and you got knocked down and uh, some guy came up and kicked you in the gut. That can cause a pancreatic pseudocyst. What is a pancreatic pseudocyst? What is it caused from? It's caused from pancreatic juices leaking out of an injured duct. So the duct breaks and pancreatic juices leak out. And that's a problem for two reasons. One, you got juices leaking out into or around the pancreas. Two, it's a problem because what are those juices? They're amylase and lipase. And those are uh, enzymatic juices that break down tissue. They break down uh, carbohydrates and fats. And so when you have that, you're going to get auto digestion of the local tissue. And that's invariably going to cause a certain degree of inflammation. Now this is not a true cyst, this is a pseudocyst, as its name implies, because it's not lined with endothelium. Uh, what it does, what it is lined with is a fibrotic wall, and that's caused from the inflammatory process. It's just granulation tissue, but it's not a real cyst because it's not lined with, uh, with endothelial tissue. So the presentation is going to vary, and it's going to vary for a few reasons. Uh, one, pseudocysts vary in size. They can be anywhere from uh, one, two centimeters large all the way up to 30 centimeters. So they vary in size. They also vary in complications. So you can have a pseudocyst that is bleeding, that would obviously be a really big, deadly problem. And you can also have a pseudocyst that's infected. And those are going to cause some uh, differences in the presentation. So what do they all have in common? Well, they typically present as a mild to moderate abdominal pain. It's going to be pain, but usually it's pain that's described more as a discomfort rather than this sharp 
pain like you get with the acute pancreatitis or with exacerbations of chronic pancreatitis. Now, there are lots of things that cause abdominal pain and discomfort, but when you're thinking of a patient with a uh, pseudocyst, you should be considering pain in a patient who has chronic pancreatitis or pain in a patient who's had a recent bout of acute pancreatitis or abdominal trauma. Now the symptoms, apart from the pain, are going to be related to uh, the processes that are going on. So remember that we have inflammation because we've got auto-digestion of local tissue, and so you can get uh, a low-grade fever from that. It's also, of course, going to cause some tenderness. Um, then, of course, because we have a cyst, and a cyst is filled with fluid, and it's large, and it presses on other tissue, you get symptoms related to the mass effect, and that's what's causing this heaviness. Not just abdominal pain, but this discomfort and heaviness and early satiety. So uh, get things like early satiety, abdominal fullness. You can get, you can actually, if it gets big enough, you can feel an abdominal mass. We didn't have that in this patient, but certainly if it gets big enough, it, it can be palpable. You can also get biliary obstruction. Uh, because the pancreas is so close to the common bile duct, you can get uh, biliary obstruction. You obstruct the common bile duct, and eventually you're going to get uh, uh, bilirubin getting taken back up into the blood. And so then the problem with that is it leads to jaundice and icterus and all the other things that you would get with an obstructive jaundice. So uh, keep in mind the effects of uh, the uh, pseudocyst because of its bulk. Uh, in addition to all of that, the two major complications that we're really concerned about with pseudocyst uh, are infection and uh, bleeding. So rarely a, a pseudocyst can present uh, with GI bleeding. And remember that we've got pancreatic juices that are, uh, that are outside of the pancreas breaking down tissue. Those juices can break down the stomach wall. Uh, they can also break down vessels. So that would lead to bleeding. And you can get bleeding into, uh, into the uh, peritoneal space. Uh, or you can get bleeding uh, directly into the stomach, which would cause hematemesis. The presentation is somewhat similar to pancreatic cancer. So remember with pancreatic cancer, you usually you have a, uh, a mass and it's usually on the head of the pancreas and it causes, in a lot of cases, uh, a biliary obstruction. And so some patients with pancreatic pseudocyst, they present with pain and uh, an obstruction. And so uh, that can make this confused with uh, pancreatic cancer. All right, so remember after sonography, abdominal CT should always be performed when there is suspicion off of ultrasound. And so here's an abdominal CT of a pancreatic pseudocyst. So here's our cyst right here. And here's the pancreas being compressed around. You can see this is a patient with chronic pancreatitis because you can see the calcifications here. Here's another pseudocyst. This one's a little bit smaller. And here's another one right here. Okay. So, uh, remember the complications. So when you get a vignette or you have a patient in real life, uh, you can suspect pseudocyst, and the pseudocyst itself, when they're, uh, when it's just abdominal fullness, not really a major emergency. However, any patient who has a pseudocyst is at risk for complications. And so those complications are infection, and that happens in about 10% of pancreatic pseudocysts. This is going to result in uh, more of a septic syndrome, so if you have infection, uh, you... Uh, are going to get bacteria either into the peritoneal space or into the blood, and so that can uh, that that will cause a hot, much higher fever, uh, chills, and uh, peritoneal signs as well as an elevated white count. This patient uh, had a high normal white count, which is probably because of the general inflammation in the cyst, but. He doesn't have the way elevated white count and the, uh, the spiking fever. These are patients 102, 103. 
not patients with a 99 degree fever. Didn't have the chills, didn't have the peritoneal signs. So uh, when you have a infected pseudocyst, look for a septic syndrome, especially those peritoneal signs. Uh, now, in the minority of patients who get uh, hemorrhage, uh, you should be looking for a sudden increase in abdominal pain. That's going to be consistent with something uh, sudden happening, like a rupture, uh, as well as a dropping hematocrit or a hemodynamic uh, instability. So what do we do to manage this? If the pseudocyst is less than six centimeters and it's asymptomatic, we can treat these patients by just observing them because most pseudocysts under six centimeters will spontaneously regress. Now keep in mind that has to be six centimeters and asymptomatic. So if it's less than six centimeters, but there's symptoms, then we have to treat it. Um, you can uh, definitely want to educate the patient uh, about what the complications can be. Uh, if they continue to have, or if they start to develop symptoms like jaundice, or early satiety, or abdominal fullness, uh, then you'll uh, follow up. Why would we ever see a patient with pseudocyst if they don't have symptoms? Uh, well, a lot of times we get CTs on patients after they've had pancreatitis, and we may see a pseudocyst. And so if there is a pseudocyst, we want to inform the patient that it's there, even though we're not going to necessarily treat it right now, we want to inform the patient that it's there so that if it does get larger or if it does cause symptoms, that they come in as soon as possible. Uh, then we'll just follow these patients up with CT to ensure that it's regressed. Now, if there are symptoms or if it's greater than six centimeters, then you're going to do an internal drainage. Usually this is done endoscopically. And a lot of times the surgeon will also get a biopsy of the cyst, and that's done because we want to differentiate it from cancer. If there's septic symptoms, then we get an external drainage. This is done percutaneously, usually under CT guidance. Uh, and then we'll also administer IV broad spectrum antibiotics. And if there's uh, hemorrhage symptoms, then this needs to be treated with either open surgery or angiography with embolization. You cannot, you never, ever, ever, ever drain uh, a hemorrhagic pseudocyst. Okay, so less than six centimeters plus no symptoms equals observation. More than six centimeters or symptoms, internal drainage. Septic symptoms, external drainage and antibiotics, hemorrhage symptoms, angiography with embolization. And this is the external drainage procedure. So uh, you're just going in endoscopically with your uh, upper endoscope and uh, the surgeon basically is drilling a uh, hole into the stomach into the pseudocyst. And so now there's going to be a communication between the cyst and the stomach. And that will decompress the cyst. Um, now, depending on where the cyst is, and this is why it's important to have the CT, obviously, you may uh, do that, uh, you may drill that hole in the stomach, or you could even do it in the duodenum if it's, uh, if it's compressing up there. So, you don't need to be aware of uh, really the details about these surgeries. Just be aware when you do internal drainage and when you do external drainage. External drainage when it's septic internal drainage when it's just a regular non-infected pancreatic pseudocyst. And remember the major complications. And if you have any questions, feel free to let... Oh wait, actually, I just want to bring up, how do we know this is probably not cancer? Because this guy in the vignette just had, uh, just had uh, acute pancreatitis uh, not that long ago. So patient with who presents like this, who has not had a recent history of acute pancreatitis, we're more concerned about cancer. This guy, because he's so recently had, uh, because he's so recently had acute pancreatitis, pseudocyst, because of such a common complication, is the more likely diagnosis. But we still want to get that biopsy, uh, just to exclude it. All right. So any questions? Let me know.